The villains of JoJo have always been a heated subject of debate, as after all, there's a lot of reasons to love and hate them, all offering their own unique flavor to a wide variety of readers. Although I'd argue that Toru has become one of, if not the most divisive villain in all of JoJo, as since his introduction, he's garnered tons of discussion, discourse, and analysis, some more credible than others, but generally, it seems everyone views this character in a different way. And not just differences in opinion, but differing interpretations of motivation values, themes, and more, leading to a point where it can become difficult to see the true intention of the character and if he really is a misunderstood masterpiece or actually the worst villain in all of JoJo. And that's what we're here to find out. So the majority of this video will be segments taken from my JoJo Land retrospective, but re-edited to present just the Toro parts. So for those looking for a Toro analysis, don't need to watch a two and a half hour retrospective. Although if you find yourself curious about more of JoJo Land as a whole, I of course recommend checking out the full two-part series. So this video will be broken down into three chapters, starting with motivation, then Toru's integration into the story and the whole twist reveal villain, and finally his purpose and what his true role was in the story. So I feel it's important to first begin with the motivation of the rock humans, as I've noticed this is an area where readers either misinterpret their plans or just forget crucial dialogue, and it's a lack of motivation that Toru is often criticized for. So let me just lay it out there as clear as possible. The rock humans don't just want money, accolades, or some legacy legacy, and this extends to Toru as well. If anything, since Toru is at the top of this whole operation, their motivation is Toru's. Since humans began developing advanced civilizations, the rock humans fell behind and were overpowered and outpopulated, lowering their position in the hierarchy of life. This was due to the rock humans' inability to work together in larger groups, like a community, being very antisocial and psychopathic creatures who lack empathy. So the rock humans had their habitats taken over by humans and have been forced to survive by a assimilating with them and adopting unnatural lifestyles, and the rock humans now resent the humans, as biologically they are superior life forms, living longer, being stronger, having the ability to turn to stone and are mostly all stand users, and have a greater connection with the earth. But since there isn't as many of them and they still struggle to work together, they haven't been able to take back power. This is a very similar situation to the pillar men from part 2. So like how the pillar men needed the red stone in order to conquer the sun to rise above humans, the rock humans need the Rokakaka to gain power within society. And since they discovered the Rokakaka, which was at least before 1941, they had been using it to gain power and wealth, and found the best way to do this was to become doctors, to use technologies to further develop and research the fruit, and use its power to exploit patients for wealth. So yes, part of their plan does involve accumulating a lot of money, but it's not because they're greedy. They are merely playing the game humans have created in order to rise above them and become the dominant species. And now, with the new Rokakaka on the mix, this would allow the rock humans to achieve their goal even quicker and with more leverage, to be in control of a medicine which essentially grants immortality through its power of exchanging cells with other people, bypassing the original fruit's limitation of individual equivalent exchange. So if they were able to control this power and mass produce it, the humans would be in the palm of their hands, giving up all of their power and land for the medicine through the previously mentioned immortality industry, ultimately rising above humans. And that is Toru's motivation in all of this, which which is an extremely compelling goal that they have clearly been working towards for a long time. Although granted, it's never explained as clearly within the manga as I just did. In fact, Toru never really elaborates on his grand scheme or what his ideal outcome is from all of this. The best we get is him saying he's going to sell Nero Kakaka at 200 million yen apiece. And with that power, society will upend itself. Even someone like Bill Gates will be buying them. But he's not excited about the money. He's thinking about what sort of world he could shape with world leaders and people like Bill Gates under his thumb. So besides this, the reader needs to piece together the previous material, such as Urban Gorilla's dialogue, Wu Tomiki's medical practice, the head doctor's lecture, and the various narrations about the rock humans to see the whole picture, which is good in the way that it keeps previous arcs relevant and slowly unveils things along the way, culminating with Toru's introduction. So he never really needed to explain himself, as if you look around him and what led us here, it clearly lays out his goal, as he wouldn't be the head doctor or have put all of this together if he had a completely different motive. Although it seems many readers did misunderstand or question his motive, either simplifying him to just wanting money or mischaracterizing him into someone who supposedly values memories or leaving behind some legacy. This specifically will be expanded upon later. 
So now that we know what he wants, let's move into how he's introduced, which is Araki's most deliberate attempt at a twist reveal main villain. His first appearance is in chapter 81. It's a short interaction that just plants the seed for the character, where we learn he's Yasuo's ex, works part-time at the hospital, expresses some interest in her, is a bit jealous of Josuke, and is probably wrapped up in all this rock human business, and that's where we left it. So although Toru is introduced shortly before Wonder of You, which is a massive red flag like, hmm, I wonder who the stand user is, maybe the character that was just introduced alongside it, I still I still think Araki did a good job with the misdirection, as we are presented with inconspicuous facts that initially clear Toru's suspicion. As I remember reading Monthly thinking, there's no way Toru is the head rock human. He went to high school with Yasuo, Yasuo remembers him, he maintained a relationship, he looks super young, and we've seen him and the head doctor in the same place. But there's a lot more than just misdirection, as a great twist needs to be one of the last things the audience would suspect, but when revealed, should be the only possible answer, which walks a fine line between predictable and compelling. If everyone guesses it because it's so obvious, it's boring. If no one guesses it because it comes out of nowhere, it's illogical and unsatisfying. So it needs to have previous moments in the story the audience can look back to that foreshadow or take on new meaning. So when viewed in retrospect, you can see the answer was right in front of you the whole time, which makes a great twist just as enjoyable if not better on a second read or watch, as you get the feeling like you've unlocked the other half of the experience and can see all of the hints you missed. So what makes the Toru twist pretty great is that Leading up to the reveal, Araki provides subtle foreshadowing of his true nature. Looking at the next time we see him in chapter 83, he's consoling Yasuo after Josuke and Mamazuku kind of yelled at her. And when Toru reaches out for Yasuo's hand, he mentions that she instinctively always puts her hand on top of his, emphasizing that she is above him, which is a metaphor for the relationship between human and rock human, as naturally over time, humans place the rock humans below them, showing that before we really know anything about Toru, he is within the shadow of Yasuo the darkness to her light. And pretty much all of the early scenes of Toru have these subtle undertones that make us suspicious of him, but is never obvious enough to feel boring, as Araki baits the audience with this love triangle between Josuke, Yasuo, and Toru. As in the following chapter, when the gang are running after the head doctor, they bump into Toru, who is presented in this superheroic way, asking Yasuo to help him save a child's life, fabricating this tender moment to try and rekindle their relationship. And when Josuke shows up, we get this pretty obvious panel layout of Yasuo caught in between them, which at the time emphasized the love triangle, but after the reveal takes on a new meaning, as Toru is drawn heavily shaded standing in the shadow of Josuke, who's brightly lit, again foreshadowing Toru as a rock human and Josuke's foil, the physical representations of a miracle versus calamity. So I do think the twist is fairly well written, really the only bullshittery going on is this guy with the blade arms that appears a few times, because later on Araki clarifies that the stand and Akafu share the same body, yet Yet we saw the unclothed stand and the head doctor in the same place as two different things, to make the reader think, oh okay, there's the head doctor, there's the stand, deflecting suspicion off of Toru. But in the volume release, Araki refers to this specifically as a stand-like energy, so not a stand. Which relates to the idea I've previously mentioned that Calamity will sometimes attach itself to people and see the natural flow. So I wouldn't say Toru is a masterclass example of twist writing, as it's by no means as meticulous as Josuke's identity, but still still serviceable. The biggest issue I have is that, beyond the initial misdirection, there didn't seem to be that much actual planning. As following Toru's reveal as the stand user, the story tries to elaborate on the character by adding him into the already established cast backstories, which feels like a retroactive decision, as it creates a few contradictions and proposes a lot of questions. So first we see that back in 1994, when Mamazuku was 14, Toru had caused his father's death, which was said to be a natural calamity, although we see Wonder of You at the funeral, and rock insects had infested their family's orchard. And of course, Toru recalls the incident to taunt Mamazuku, so he was undoubtedly involved and had some sort of interest in their family back then. And this all happens right before Mamazuku's death, so it just comes off as a faint attempt to create a personal connection between the two at the climax of their fight. So I'm perfectly okay with adding more to Mamazuku before his death, but having it all revolve around Toru just feels forced and unconsidered until just recently. And this problem appears again when we see Toru in Yasuo's flashback back when she's around 9 years old, and Toru uses her and her stand to help steal the identity of Akafu Satoru, so we can assume it was around this time he infiltrated the hospital as the head doctor, although it makes me question why he then waited years for Yasuo to get older before going to high school. 
So you could assume the reason he went to high school at all was to get into med school and work in the same hospital as a stand as he's doing right now. But if that was the plan, why not start school around the same time Yasuo showed him Akafu? Or he even could have stolen a younger identity and skipped school altogether, as it doesn't seem like the best use of time in this whole world domination plan. So you might think that Toru actually does care for Yasuo in some twisted way, and that was the reason he waited for her to grow up to contact her. Although the way he treats her throughout this arc, I just can't take that idea seriously at all. Toru only uses Yasuo for his personal gain or laments about their past in attempts to exploit her, and in the end, feels no remorse towards trying to kill her or her pain or ever expresses a genuine emotion to her besides anger. Which leaves no other reason why he would go to high school with Yasuo besides the twisted idea that he found her valuable, so he decided to form a deep connection with her at a young age in case he ever needed to use her or her stand again, and could use their past relationship and nostalgic feelings of first love to exploit her which is exactly what he does in this arc, which is pretty messed up considering Toru is probably over 100 years old and first met Yasuo when she was 9. And based on that interaction, decided he would try and date her when she's older and fabricated this entire relationship emotionally and physically, so at any point in her life, he could return to manipulate her for his personal gain. Which is definitely one of the most deplorable things Araki has ever written in a character, and really amplifies the lengths the rock humans will go to feed off of humans. And it's mostly because of his past relationship with Yasuo, Toru has always come off as an extremely unlikable character. Like I get it, he's written as a terrible person and not supposed to be liked, but at least to me, he was never that villain I love to hate, but rather just an overly unnecessary creep, like actually a straight up grooming ass with not much room for interpretation, that puts the most endearing character through so much trauma and suffering for really no good reason, and it just comes off as forced near in the end. Like Toru's thought process was, hmm, maybe Yasuo will be useful someday, let me ruin her life and spend so much time in high school building this relationship focused on this side quest that has nothing to do with the hospital plan, and just feels a little too obvious as Araki trying to add a personal connection to a main character right at the end, similar to Mamazuku's past. So at least to me, Toru comes off as not being handled as carefully or fleshed out as well as the previous villains. As sure, the writing makes you hate Toru through his actions, but that's easy. What people really want is to become invested in the villain through complexity dynamics, maybe even a little empathy drawn to them. In a way that we obviously know they're a terrible person and can condemn their actions, but still enjoy seeing them on screen and spending time with them, which isn't as easy as simply making a character unlikable, but instead make the audience love to hate them because they're fun to watch and do absurd things with a sense of charisma and personality or are given the proper time to establish depth and complex ideals so we can understand them. These are just some of the basic reasons why people love to hate Dio, Kira, and Pucci pretty much all of the past villains. So I'm not saying Toru is bad because he isn't an exact copy of Kira for example, just that with Toru, even putting the whole groomer criticism aside, which is hard to do, we never saw another side to the character. He's only ever wearing a mask for Yasuo or at odds with the Higashikatas. The potential is there, but isn't fully explored. What does Toru's ideal world actually look like? What does it mean to be a rock human and have lived in the shadows for generations? Did something specific happen to Toru that led him to spearhead this decade-long scheme of playing doctor and developing 6251, what separates Toru from the other rock humans? And that's where myself and I feel many others have a disconnect with the character. And now that we've gone in depth with the research team as a whole and where it's all led, it's hard to ignore that although Jojolian is the longest part and had the most potential for its villain, we instead get Toru, who we don't see until chapter 81 and isn't even revealed as a villain until 97. So clearly, Araki didn't do what people expected him to and made the choice to sacrifice a lot of development and insight for instead a 15 or so chapter twist that put the focus on the stand, which to give him credit is at least something different and unexpected, but clearly not beloved by all. So obviously I don't think Toru is a masterpiece, but he's absolutely misunderstood and often not given the proper credit he deserves, as people constantly view him and judge him in the exact context as every other villain in the series, and deemed bad because he's so different, while ignoring the fact that he's not written with the same intention, leading to so much reaching and mischaracterization trying to artificially add depth to a character who is only given a fraction of development as previous villains, limited to the mindset that Toru has to fit the mold of what came before. This case for Toru's depth and greater meaning is often presented with his philosophy of dream and memories, which I'm sure is something you've all heard before, but I feel like has been parroted to the point where people don't even understand what they're saying. Claiming Toru is a man stuck in the past, never 
forever changing hanging on to his precious memories, trying to create some legacy to permeate his existence through memories, and in turn makes him a perfect foil to Josuke who only thinks in the present, making new memories, letting go of his past. I don't know where people extracted this idea from, but I guess it sounds sophisticated enough to persuade opinions, as it seems dreams and memories is always the default response to any form of Toru criticism, and is something I've been seeing regurgitated in nearly every Toru related comment, video, or thread I've come across when researching and writing on the character. When the reality is, everything Toru has done is with the future in mind. His actions are all in pursuit of a better future for the rock humans to grow, expand, and reach new heights, fighting not only for himself but for his species, dedicating his life to the rock humans' survival, to ensure that in the future they no longer have to hide within human society but instead restructure society, place humans below them and become the dominant species, taking back the silicone-based earth they feel belongs to them. Seen in 1941, growing Rokakaka, learning about its power, infiltrating the hospital, experimenting and developing 6251, and ruthlessly hunting down the new Rokakaka, thinking first and foremost of the rock human's future. I don't see what part of these actions or his motivation suggest Toru being stuck in the past or valuing his dreams and memories above all else. He has no interest in preserving what once was or to create some legacy. He's not seeking the spotlight or validation from anyone, let alone humans who he views as inferior. The whole focus on dreams and memories just seems like a complete fallacy created out of a desire to artificially add more to the character, which misses the point entirely. Toru only actually says dreams and memories a few times, and when he does, he's either using these ideas to manipulate Yasuo, or he says it directly to those who he thinks have failed and are going to die. This is because Toru's concept of dreams and memories represents failure and one's inability to achieve their goal, which is a very rock human-like perspective, being creatures who lack empathy and may view these hopeful sentiments humans have as just another reason why they're so weak. As Toru says, farewell Yasuo, when everything's over, all that will remain are dreams and memories. He's saying that when Yasuo is gone, nothing she ever tried to achieve will be realized, and all that will remain is the dreams and memories of her failed ambition within Toru, leaving no tangible effect on the world. This position is further defined the next time he mentions this philosophy to Kato, saying, there is a rock atop some other rocks. What that rock witnesses is only dreams and memories. Memories of the landscape from those scenic cliffs, only those dreams remain, that which remains in the end. In this scene, Toru represents the rock atop other rocks, as he's the rock human at the top, who bears witness to the dreams and memories, as that's all that remain of those who oppose him, dreams that were never realized. Toru continues to taunt Kato, saying that her son is lying dead, covered in blood, without having any of his desires coming true, and asks Kato, what do you all have left in the end? Suggesting the dreams they leave behind are meaningless, and at no point does Toru place any intrinsic value on memories or suggest they are important to him. Rather, he makes it pretty clear that he believes to have your dreams remain is a bad thing because it means you're going to die without fulfilling them, not understanding that dreams can live on in those around you, something a rock human couldn't understand. This is why in Toru's final moments, when he's fully lost his composure and realizes he's dying, he's greeted with a memory of a wasp, showing that Toru is leaving behind his dreams and memories, which is exactly what he didn't want to do, and the memory represents his idea of failure. And if we go back to the I Am A Rock analysis from part one, I made the case that the lyrics to the song were a blueprint for the rock human's nature. Considering Yotsuyu had recited the lyrics during his arc was the introduction to the rock humans, and just in general, it describes them perfectly. And nearing the end of the song, there is the lyric, don't talk of love, well I've heard the word before, it's sleeping in my memory. I won't disturb the slumber of feelings that have died, if I never loved, I never would have cried. Which means, in order to disconnect from the world and to be a rock in an island, you need to separate yourself from others in sentimentality, bury your emotions, memories, and any feelings of love. As if you have no one to love, you'll never mourn someone's loss, you'll never get hurt or be disappointed. And relating this to Toru, during his arc, we learn about the birthing process for rock humans, and that after they are born, not even their mothers have an emotional connection to the child and will abandon them in the forest, leaving the child to fend for itself and hopefully be able to attach itself to a hornet, where once taken to the nest, the child will seek out the queen and take over its body, and will then spend the next 17 years taking host of generations of queens until it undergoes metamorphosis, and becomes full grown, killing the queen and the entire nest in the process. And it's said, as the baby seeks out the queen, it's all based on instinct, and the child will cling onto the hornet as if seeking love or maternity. So the queen is the closest thing a rock human will ever come to feeling love or family, 
but once they're fully born, they kill, abandon, and bury those feelings in their memory, making sure not to ever disturb their dormant feelings of love. But when Toru is defeated by Kato of all people, a mother acting to protect her family and whose hair strongly resembles a hornet's nest, it disturbs Toru's sleeping memory of his own mother, which brings the dichotomy of humans and rock human full circle, as what ultimately allowed the Higashikatas to defeat Toru was the will to protect their family, strength given to them through emotions like love and dreams, which proves Toru wrong, as they believe in hope which allows dreams to live on, as Jobin's dream is passed to Kato and is able to achieve that goal even after he's dead, something Toru didn't think was possible and leads to his death, as this happens just moments after he asks Kato, what do you all have left in the end? So I have to be honest and say it's a bit unfortunate to see so much analysis and advocating for Toru to be placed on this specific dialogue that pretty much ignores the context of who he's actually speaking to and why he might be saying these things. It's like people just read the line, all that remains are dreams and memories, and jump to the conclusion that it's his entire motivation or what he values. When he's saying these things to taunt his victims and to show his distinct lack of humanity. So the idea that Toru is a man who values sentimental abstractions so much that it defines him or creates contrast with Josuke is, in my opinion, a gross mischaracterization and just ignores everything that's led up to him and why he's even fighting. And if you really wanted to make this a parallel between Toru and Josuke, it makes more sense that Toru misunderstands and devalues memories when Josuke, our representation of hope and humanity, holds them close to his heart and are what make him strong, remembering the precious time he spent with Yasuo, his family, and doesn't bury his past, as he's fighting for Holly, showing the importance of dreams and memories. So following Jojolian's conclusion, there is very much a desire for more out of Toru, leading people to cling on to every drop of dialogue trying to decipher some greater meaning or alternate motivation, pointing to a lot of the dialogue he shares with Yasuo. But again, you have to understand, leading up to Toru's reveal, he's only ever trying to manipulate Yasuo and pull her away from Josuke. And you can't take his words at face value, as he understands humans value memories and views this as a weakness. This all began when Yasuo gets wrapped up in the Dr. Wu fight, then immediately, Toru begins to appear. And the more Yasuo pursues, the harder Toru tries to win her back. Like his insanely desperate voicemail saying he loves her more than he ever has and he has no idea why he left her, and wants to meet up at the place where they had all of those dreams and memories together. So the first time Toru even uses this phrase, it's a lie, trying to exploit Yasuo's emotions and get her away from Josuke. Another instance of his manipulation is when he's talking to Yasuo about his frustrations when his wireless charging patent was rejected by a bunch of major companies, that pretty much told him he's too late, it's already been done. And this rejection has led some to think that this altered Toru's motivation, and now he's trying to create a legacy, to be the first person to accomplish something revolutionary and be remembered for that, which is apparently why he's so focused on the Rokakaka medicine. This interpretation, in my opinion, is complete nonsense. The idea that Toru would be proud of creating a patent for wireless charging or even care what humans think about him goes completely against his known actions, as Toru had already been working on 6251 a whole decade before this apparent rejection. And if we actually look at the context in which he's saying these things, we can see the larger intention. He's speaking to Yasuo after her first attempt at reaching the head doctor, so he knows that she's working with Josuke and they're trying to stop him. So the way I see it is that Toru uses the wireless charging story as an excuse to get back Yasuo's trust. As he first says, Yasuo inspired him to pursue the idea, as back then she spoke in the way of a goddess, saying electricity spills out and flies into the sky, which Yasuo makes a face at and doesn't even remember saying, alluding to the idea that Toru could just be gaslighting her. As he goes on to say that after he was rejected, he felt a lot of anxiety and anger and just wanted to disappear, which is the excuse he uses for why he stopped contacting Yasuo. But after knowing who Toru really is, this whole story is clearly just bullshit. He only ever returns to Yasuo when he needs something, lying and manipulating her time and time again. Notice how with this story, he makes Yasuo think she gave him the idea, which led to his anxiety and anger, purposely trying to make her feel bad and like it was her fault that he left. Then he gets on his hands and knees practically begging her to forgive him, asking her to think about going back to those days when they were happy. And people will seriously cite this dialogue as evidence that Toru values his memories with Yasuo and is a man stuck living in the past, completely blind to context. Because while he's begging Yasuo for forgiveness, he just so happens to steer the conversation, saying Josuke is innocent, but where is he right now? I know you're probably thinking something like that. Trying to exploit her trust and feelings of Josuke into revealing his location, which is what he's actually after, but needed to make up with Yasuo 
Tetsuo before she would trust him again. And as the scene continues, every word out of Toru's mouth is a lie. So to believe that he cared about a wireless charging patent or it made him so upset he wanted to disappear from the world, while simultaneously making progress with 6251 and leading a rock human organization is just absurd. But I don't really get down with the idea that everything Toru says is just meaningless, so the only truth I could maybe see slipping out from his words here is the feelings of anger and anxiety he mentions. Angry about the state of the world considering he spent his whole life for one purpose, to change it, and the anxiety of never achieving this goal, as this ties into the dialogue he had when he first met Yasuo. As in the past, it makes more sense for him to be honest with a little girl who wouldn't remember or understand the truth behind his words. As he's very honest telling Yasuo he's in need of a very specific kind of person who would turn out to be Akafu Satoru. And in this scene, Toru says he's a troubled soul who's lost his way. The moment I find the path I'm searching for, I'll leave down it. And this is genuinely some of the only insight we ever get into Toru's personal life. When there is this huge gap in his life we never learn about that unfortunately makes it even harder to believe in him. As during Jojolian's epilogue, we see him growing the Rokakaka in Japan in 1941. Yet it took him 60 years to do anything meaningful with it? Did it take him all of that time to come up with the doctor plan or to assemble the rock humans? Did he try something else before and fail? What was his original way he says he had lost? So there is potential here for a more fleshed out villain who readers may have even been able to sympathize with if we just knew more about him, but it's never explored. So coming back to the original point of this section, I find it ironic that most of the discussion I've seen that advocate for Toru will often base their entire arguments on this misunderstood analysis of dreams and memories, literally being manipulated by his words just like Yasuo, and often don't mention the very real aspects of his character like his compelling motivation, his representation of the rock humans in their pure state, and everything with wonder of you. Which sometimes feels unlike anything else I've seen from the JoJo community before, which is saying something. As when it comes to Toru, it seems people are only ever on the most extreme ends of the spectrum. He's either the worst villain Araki has ever written, or he's so misunderstood and actually the best, followed by paragraphs of reaching further than Starfinger, almost like an overcorrection to combat a lot of the negativity surrounding him at the time. As this seemed to be more of an issue back when Jojolian first ended, but lately I've noticed people have a more measured response, acknowledging that he absolutely excels in some aspects, but falls short in others. Which is expected when he's only presented as a villain for 10 chapters, and in exchange offers a more compelling stand. So it makes sense that one outshines the other, and that there would be more focus put on the concept of Calamity itself. As since the beginning, Jojolian has fundamentally been a story about Calamity, and Toru isn't Calamity, he's merely a harbinger of its power, that plays a necessary role in Josuke's story, but isn't the story. And that brings us back to Josuke, who we really haven't talked about in a while, as if you noticed, he's distinctly separated from the larger climax. He's not there for the harvest of the new fruit, to hear the villain's final monologue, or to even deliver the finishing blow. He's isolated back at the hospital, opposing Wonder of You, fighting an enemy who has no face, no identity, and steals the faces and names of others. And it's because this concept Wonder of You represents is Josuke's true adversary. Josuke's fight for the entire part has been with himself. He's always looked to the past and held onto faces and names that don't belong to him, always wondering if he's Kira Yoshikage or Joseph Ume Kujo, or if his thoughts are even his own. And Wonder of You is a reflection of who Josuke was for a majority of the part, essentially coming face to face with himself, a man trying to replicate the identity of someone else. And his ability to literally go beyond Wonder of You symbolically proves his individualism, showing that he is more than, he is beyond, just an adopted identity, destroying the personification of his own insecurities and finally becoming his own person. So while Toru and Wonder of You are technically one entity as their words and ideas come from the same mind, they fulfill very different roles, as Toru, the manipulative and parasitic rock human, is the villain for Yasuo and the Higashikadas, who have been plagued by rock creatures and the rock disease their entire lives, while Wonder of You is more thematically appropriate for Josuke, being those physical embodiments of a miracle and Calamity, who in the end, Josuke still needs to defeat even after Toru has died, fully overcoming his lack of identity as in this post-mortem state, Wonder of You truly has no face. So Josuke never needed to be the perfect foil to Toru's personalities or ideals, and I don't think he was ever supposed to be. So I hope that gives people a better understanding of why Josuke and Toru are written so differently from the typical hero-villain dynamic in Jojo. Hell, Josuke didn't even know he was fighting Toru until chapter 1 
104 because it didn't really matter, and this is by no means a rocky fumbling just because it's something unfamiliar, as when taking a step back you can see he was actually able to do more than he ever has before, giving Josuke, Yasuo, and the Higashikatas their own individual battles to overcome from one villain. So in the end, Toru remains divisive and complicated, as in many ways, I do think he could be considered the best villain in all of JoJo, while simultaneously the worst. He's just complicated and does a lot of things and is a completely new approach for Rocky, so at the very least, I think should be appreciated for that. So thank you all so much for watching this Toru analysis. If you want to see more about Jojolian, Wonder Review, Josuke, and everyone else that we saw throughout that story, be sure to check out part one and part two of the Jojolian retrospective that goes into go beyond the themes and just everything Jojo related. So thank you all so much for watching. Please like the video if you enjoyed or learned something new and subscribe for more Jojo and the Jojo Lens content. All right, I'll talk to you guys all real soon. Thank you again for watching and I'm out. Peace.